Hello and welcome to another episode in our series, State of the Election. Because of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, the introduction of much more widespread mail-in voting, the uncertainty of a peaceful transition should Trump lose, and his warning about the possibility of Nancy Pelosi becoming president in the delayed election result scenario, we thought that now would be a good time to explain a few possible outcomes of the election particularly now that the President and First Lady have tested positive for the coronavirus. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the possibility of Nancy Pelosi assuming the presidency, what other scenarios could result from a contested election, and how the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, along with the battle to replace her, could affect the election's outcome. But let me just say now that while President Pelosi is indeed possible, it's not quite in the way you think, and it's extremely unlikely. Sorry, Nancy. Before we start, thanks to all of our viewers who helped us reach 100,000 subscribers, just beating the TLDR EU channel to 100k. So now the competition is over, feel free to go over and subscribe to our sister channel, which focuses on European news. From Sweden's controversial Covid tactics, where they never locked down at all, Facebook's threats to pull out of Europe, and an explanation of how the hell Europe all links together. A link to the channel can be found in the description below. So, let's start this video with a few key points. The general election is scheduled for November 3rd. However, neither the president nor the vice president is actually elected that day. The Electoral College has that responsibility, and while they never meet as one body, federal law does dictate that they meet on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December, or in this case, December 14th. We made a whole video on the Electoral College, so we won't rehash all of that, and you can check out that video by clicking the link in the description. Trust us, you'll want the context. So, as we explained in that video, if no candidate receives a majority in the Electoral College, or in the case of a tie, the House of Representatives gets to choose the President, and the Senate decides the Vice President, in what's known as a contingent election. But how could a contingent election result in Nancy Pelosi becoming President? Well, several things would have to happen. First of which would be a tie or no majority in the Electoral College, which in itself is rare, having only happened twice. Congress would then have to be unable to select a president or vice president between January 6th, the day that Congress opens, counts and certifies electoral votes, and January 20th, the constitutionally mandated day that ends the term of the president and vice president. So if on January 20th a president or vice president has not been selected, then the Presidential Secession Act of 1947 takes place. That act, passed in the aftermath of the death of President Franklin Roosevelt in 1945, lays out the presidential line of succession, beginning with the Vice President, then the Speaker of the House, then the President pro tempore of the Senate, followed by the President's Cabinet in the order that the departments were created. So in this case, it will be Vice President Mike Pence, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and Iowa Senator and President pro temp of the Senate, Chuck Grassley. However, this is still not the end of the President Pelosi debate. While Pelosi is currently the Speaker of the House, and as such, would fall in line of succession if a contingent election were to yield no result by January 20th, as we pointed out before in this series, congressional elections are also happening at the same time as the presidential election. Because of that, it would be the new Congress that would act in our hypothetical contingent election. So, President Pelosi would depend on Democrats keeping control of the House and re-electing Nancy Pelosi as Speaker. There is one other thing of note regarding potential President Pelosi. Assuming this scenario did come to fruition, Pelosi would only become acting president until such time a president were to be elected in the House of Representatives or a vice president elected by the Senate, so it wouldn't even come close to a full term. It's also worth noting that an acting president isn't an unfamiliar circumstance for the country, having happened on a few occasions. Section 3 of the 25th Amendment to the US Constitution essentially provides the president with the ability to temporarily relinquish the powers of the presidency in the case of incapacity. George W. Bush, for example, underwent a colonoscopy in 2002 and again in 2007. Both times, Bush submitted a letter to Congress, temporarily transferring the powers of the presidency to then-Vice President Dick Cheney. 
So even if Pelosi were to be elevated to the presidency, she would remain there only until Congress chose a president or vice president. Now, you might have heard that President Trump was recently diagnosed with the coronavirus, and this section of the 25th Amendment could come into play should the president have to be placed on a ventilator. However, at the time of writing, the president's medical team have reported him as feeling well and in good spirits, and did not see the need for any supplemental oxygen remedies. There have been some conflicting reports though, but until we have more evidence, it's not likely that they'll need to invoke the 25th. Anyway, you may be wondering why there need to be so many redundancies surrounding the secession of president. Well, there are two reasons for this. The first is the number of deaths historically among presidents, coupled with the need to maintain a working government, especially in a time of crisis. Four US presidents have been assassinated, and another four have died while in the job, as well as the resignation of Nixon in 1974. So the redundancies regarding secession provide guidance for any possible situation in order to ensure the continuity of government. The second reason is the result of modern warfare. With the use of nuclear weapons and the president's role as commander-in-chief of the military, the nuclear codes have to be transferred to the next president as to ensure their security. So what other scenarios could we see? Well, aside the constitutional crises we've just discussed, there is the possibility of a contested election. If the vote is very close between the candidates, it may trigger recounts in certain states and or litigation in order to sort it out. Again, contested elections are nothing new in US political history. In the national nightmare that was the election of 2000, for example, ballot disputes in the state of Florida caused then-Vice President Al Gore to withdraw his concession to George W. Bush. After a month of litigation, the Supreme Court finally stepped in and halted recounts in Florida, ultimately handing the whole election to Bush. My point is that whatever happens, the constitution and statutory laws that deal with presidential elections and secession provide guidance for different outcomes, many of which the US has experienced at some point or another. But then again, 2020 has been a year of firsts. That brings us to the last topic to discuss. As I'm sure you've heard by now, Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, and President Trump has tapped Judge Amy Coney Barrett to replace Ginsburg. There are three aspects of this nomination to consider. The first is pretty obvious. Replacing the leader of the liberal bloc of the court with a textualist like Barrett certainly changes the dynamic of the court, likely continuing the conservative majority for some time. And it could continue even longer should Trump win re-election, as there's always the possibility of another vacancy over the next four years. As far as the presidential and congressional elections are concerned, it would likely depend on how voters deal with the perception of hypocrisy from both parties. Now, before I continue, we're not saying that hypocrisy is abound, and we're also not saying that it's not. However, there's certainly the perception among some that both parties have changed their tune since 2016, with the Democrats now saying that the next president should fill the vacancy, and the Republicans wanting to fill the seat in an election year. Now, to be fair, there are a few major differences between 2016 and now, as we discussed in our recent video on the topic. There's a link to that in the description. We also have to remember that how senators vote on Barrett's nomination could help or hurt them as well. Despite being a Democrat, Doug Jones of Alabama, for example, could lose his seat if he votes against Barrett. As he voted against the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh and comes from a state that overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump in 2016, a vote against Barrett will probably not be good for him politically. However, the same could be said of vulnerable Republicans, Collins of Maine and Gardner of Colorado, for example, whose more democratic states may not approve of them voting in favor of Barrett's nomination. It's also worth mentioning that this vacancy could have consequences beyond just this election. Democrats have been threatening the idea of packing the court should they gain control of the government next year. The idea of packing the court has been around in democratic politics since the Great Depression with then-President Franklin Roosevelt proposing increasing the number of justices from 9 to 15, after the court struck down several of his New Deal programs as unconstitutional. However, Roosevelt was unable to gain enough support for the plan, largely because it was seen as a purely political move in an effort to gain a court that would rule in his favour, and he eventually abandoned the plans. So, if the Democrats do move to pack the court, it will probably do them well to learn from Roosevelt's mistakes. There's one more matter we need to discuss. Early Friday morning, President Trump announced that he and First Lady Melania had both tested positive for the coronavirus. 
And a few hours later, it was announced that Vice President Mike Pence and Second Lady Karen Pence both tested negative. As I'm sure you've seen, the situation has evolved over the weekend, and there's a certain amount of uncertainty about the president's condition, with crucial days clearly ahead. Now, we certainly wish the president, first lady, and all others a speedy recovery, but it does present a new question. What happens to the election if anything should happen to Trump? Well, the first thing that would happen is that Vice President Mike Pence would ascend to the presidency, as stated in the Constitution, becoming the ninth vice president in US history to ascend to the presidency because of the death of their predecessor. Then, President Pence would most likely take Trump's place on the ticket and choose a running mate. It's worth noting that this scenario would be a first in US presidential elections, with the only even slightly similar case dating all the way back to 1868. We should also note here that it's unlikely that Trump will be incapacitated for long, as Boris Johnson and other world leaders weather the disease fairly easily. Now, while Johnson is only 55 and Trump is 74, Trump has no underlying medical conditions, at least that we know of. What do you think? How should the country handle the turbulent days ahead? Are you worried about electoral chaos and a lack of a clear winner out of the election? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified whenever we post. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.